Hearing the Truth Radio. Welcome all who want to know the truth of God and the Bible. I'm Mike Ward with D.S. Ferris, and the message today is the Counter-Reformation. D.S., in a prior study, we've seen that the Jesuit order developed the futurist system of prophetic interpretation. This was definitely one of the aspects of the Counter-Reformation. I think it's imperative that we know more about the Jesuits and more about the Counter-Reformation. We should know more about this history. This indispensable information will clarify Rome's intentions for the world. As you well know, the Protestant Reformation was the most powerful ideological force to ever come against Romanism. The Protestants said the Bible, not tradition, is supreme. The Protestants also said the Pope and his kingdom constitute the Antichrist. With these two views alone, the papacy was destined for complete ruination. The papacy felt the pressure of Protestantism. We must ask, what was the Catholic Church's solution against Protestantism? The Counter-Reformation, headed by the Jesuits, was that solution against the Protestant Reformation. The first part of the Counter-Reformation was the formal recognition of the Jesuits. We must ask, what is the Jesuit order? The Jesuit order is a society of men who dedicate themselves to the protection and advancement of the Catholic Church. The Jesuits have long been known to be the soldiers of the papacy. The most potent force ever to come against Protestantism was and is the Jesuit order. Ignatius Loyola, or Don Inigo Lopez de Loyola, between 1491 through 1556, was the founder of this society. History shows that in 1537, Loyola and his companions developed the ambition to protect the Catholic Church from all enemies. In 1540, Pope Paul III issued a bull that, quote, directed those who enrolled in this army to bear the standard of the cross, to wield the arms of God, to serve the only Lord, and the Roman pontiff, his vicar on earth, end of quote, says Wiley in the History of Protestantism, volume 2, page 386. In other words, in 1540, the Pope acknowledged the army of the Jesuits as a society whose purpose would be to protect the Catholic Church. Yes, now let's talk more about the purpose of this organization and the days of its inception. What was the purpose of Ignatius Loyola's new society? The purpose of the Jesuit order was to recapture all the ground lost to Protestantism. It was the studied aim of the Jesuits to become the masters of the world, to bring all men into submission and subservience to the Roman Catholic Church. From the beginning, the purpose of the Jesuit order was to overthrow Protestantism, and their ultimate goal was to become the masters of the world. Dr. Froome gives an excellent summary of the worldwide Jesuit expansion. He says, From 1540, then, the Counter-Reformation may be dated. Within 50 years, the Jesuits had planted stations in Peru, Africa, the islands of the East Indies, Hindustan, Japan, and China, and before long in the Canadian forest and the American colonies. Their members secured important chairs in universities. They became counselors and confessors to monarchs, and were the most able of all Catholic preachers. By 1615, they had a membership of 13,000. Thus, through the Jesuits, the Counter-Reformation, next to the Protestant Reformation itself, became the most memorable movement in the history of modern times. And that comes from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, page 464. You want to talk about men of dedication, the Jesuits achieved a lot of power. Yes, and how did the Jesuits achieve such power? A modern-day Jesuit, Malachi Martin, tells us, he says, There was no continent Jesuits did not reach, no known language they did not speak and study, or in scores of cases develop, no culture they did not penetrate, no branch of learning and science they did not explore, no work in humanism, in the arts, and popular education they did not undertake and do better than anyone else. And this comes from the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus and the Betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church, page 27. Now, having demonstrated that the first step of the Counter-Reformation was the recognition of the Jesuit order, we can now move on to step two. The second step of the Counter-Reformation against Protestantism was the Council of Trent, 
What was the most important foundation of Protestantism? The most important foundation of Protestantism was the Bible. Dr. Froome tells us that the discussions in the Council of Trent focused on Luther's positions. What were Luther's positions? Number one, that Holy Scripture contains all things necessary to salvation and that it is sacrilege to place tradition on a level with the Scriptures. Two, that certain books accepted as canonical in the Latin Vulgate are apocryphal and not canonical. Three, that the meaning of Scripture is plain and can be understood without churchly commentary by aid of the Holy Spirit. And this comes from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, page 474. Well, I completely agree with those three positions of Protestantism. So do I, but the Catholic Church does not agree with those positions. In the fourth session of the Council of Trent, the attitude of the papacy towards the Word of God becomes apparent. Dowling tells us, in this session a decree was passed which placed tradition upon an equality with the scriptures declared the books of the Apocrypha to be part of the Word of God, elevated the Latin translation of the scriptures called the Vulgate to an authority superior to that of the inspired Hebrew and Greek originals, and enacted severe penal laws against the liberty of the press. And that comes from History of Romanism, page 479. Note this clearly. At the Council of Trent, tradition was placed on an equality with scripture, and the Apocrypha was considered canonical. This was important for Rome, because so much of their religion is based on tradition and extra-biblical sources. Now, in the following, Dowling cites the words of the Council of Trent. He says, The sacred, holy, ecumenical, and general Council of Trent, lawfully assembled in the Holy Spirit, the three before-mentioned legates of the apostolic see presiding therein, having constantly in view the removal of error and the preservation of the purity of the gospel in the church, which gospel promised before by the prophets in the sacred scriptures was first orally published by our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who afterwards commanded it to be preached by his apostles to every creature as the source of all saving truth and, dis and discipline. And perceiving that this truth and discipline are contained, now watch this closely, are contained both in written books and unwritten traditions. And this is cited in History of Romanism, page 479. All right, DS, what are the unwritten traditions of the Catholic Church? I will let J.A. Wiley answer your question. He says, we may state that the traditions which the Church of Rome has thus placed on a level with the Bible are the supposed sayings of Christ and the apostles handed down by tradition. Of course, no proof exists that such things were ever spoken by those to whom they are imputed. What? They were never known or heard of till the monks of the Middle Ages gave them to the world. And this comes from the papacy, History, Dogmas, Genius, and Prospects, Book 2, page 171. In other words, there are supposed sayings of Christ and the apostles that have been handed down generation after generation. And these so-called traditions have been kept intact by Rome. But does the papacy really expect me to believe that that supposed sayings of Christ to the apostles were really handed down to the monks of the earlier centuries? This is even more ridiculous than using the extra-biblical books of junk, like the secrets of Enoch and Baruch. In actuality, this operation reminds me a lot of the Jews in the day of Christ who used the oral traditions of the Talmud. We know that the Talmud was the supposed sayings of Moses, and this book oftentimes replaced the teachings of the real Hebrew Bible. This is exactly why in Matthew 15, 6-9, Jesus said, Thus you have made the commandments of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's exactly right. Martin Chemnitz, between 1522 through 1586, also made that same connection, for he tells us, the Talmudists embellished their fictions by pretending that Moses on Mount Sinai received from God not only what he wrote, but also a mystical and secret exposition of the law, which he neither wrote nor wanted written, but handed down orally, and recommended that it be delivered to posterity from hand to hand. 
and they say that both are the word of God, to be received and respected with equal reverence and devotion. And if the Talmud had not been written beforehand, I would surely have thought that the rabbis had taken this theory over from the papists, and had accommodated it to their traditions. For so great is the similarity that there can be no doubt that both the fictions of the Talmudists and of the papists concerning traditions have one and the same architect and maker, namely him who sows and mixes tares with the good seed. And this comes from the examination of the Council of Trent concerning Holy Scripture, section 3, paragraph 5, page 67. Wow, the papacy doesn't just borrow from paganism, they borrow the errors of all religious systems. Yes, I guarantee that those behind the Council of Trent never had any intention of supporting God's holy word. Their intentions were to exalt traditions far above the Bible. Yes, that is the case. It is important to realize that the Roman Church, though pretending to honor the Scriptures and the Council, in reality was debasing the Scriptures and seeking every way to discredit their meaning in the hope that they would be justified in the condemnation of Protestantism. It was simple destructive logic on the part of the papacy at the Council of Trent. Protestantism was basing their beliefs on the Scriptures, so the papacy had to discredit the source. Now, in addition to the papal system of unwritten traditions, which undermine the Bible, the Council of Trent even went so far as to canonize the apocryphal books. Why did the Council do this? The papacy had to find a justification for teachings that contradict the canonical scriptures. So they sought justification in the extra-biblical sources. No wonder the Jesuits had no problem creating futurism from the Belayar myth of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. The Council of Trent justified their extra-biblical usage. That is correct. And now I will demonstrate a few more doctrines that were created from these pseudo-books. The sale of indulgences. What are the sale of indulgences? J.A. Wiley tells us in the following. Christ suffered more than was required for the salvation of the elect. Many of the saints and martyrs likewise have performed more good works than were requisite for their own salvation. And these to which it is not uncommon to add the merits of the virgin have been all thrown into a common fund, which has been entrusted to the keeping of the church. Of this treasury the Pope keeps the key, and whoever feels that his merits are not enough to carry him to heaven has only to apply at this ghostly depot, where he may buy for a reasonable sum whatever he needs to supplement his deficiencies. And this comes from the Papacy, History, Dogmas, Genius and Prospects, Book 2, pages 333 and 334. Now for emphasis, what is the sale of indulgences? Notice again the words of Wiley on page 334 where he says, In this market which Rome has opened for the sale of spiritual wares, money is not less indispensable than it is in the emporiums of earthly and perishable merchandise. The price varies, being regulated by the same laws which govern the price of earthly commodities. To cover a crime of great magnitude, a larger amount of merit is of course required. And for that, it is but reasonable that a larger sum should be given. DS, do you realize how serious this is? Absolutely. The Roman Catholic Church made salvation and redemption a thing to be purchased with money under the Pope's blessing. And that's not all. They've even went so far as to say that the righteousness of the saints, the martyrs, and the Virgin Mary can be transferred to a person for the purpose of salvation. Does this not say that Christ's blood is not good enough to save? These workers of iniquity are actually teaching that we can only be saved so long as we purchase with money the righteousness of other human beings and not Christ. Oh yeah, it's amazing the kind of salvific fiction that was created from these books of junk, as you say, Mike. Yeah, that's what they are. Now here are some more examples. According to 2 Maccabees 12, 44-46, we should pray for the dead. We read in the following, For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them in death. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead, that they might be freed from this sin. According to Tobit 6, 7 through 9, we should make incantations. We read in the following. Afterward, they traveled on together till they were near Midia. The boy asked the angel this question. Brother Azariah, what medical value is there in the fish's heart, liver, and gall? 
He answered, As regards the fish's heart and liver, if you burn them so that smoke surrounds a man or a woman who is afflicted by a demon or evil spirit, the affliction will leave him completely, and no demons will ever return to him again. And as for the gall, if you rub it on the eyes of a man who has cataracts, blowing into his eyes right on the cataracts, his sight will be restored. Let's try that. DS, what are incantations? Incantations are a ritualistic form of reciting charms and spells, the purpose being to gain some magical effect. This is witchcraft stemming back to the mystical aspects of paganism. In the papacy, the praying over the dead is accompanied with incantations. So it is apparent why 2nd Maccabees and Tobit would have been so important to the Catholic Church during the Council of Trent. All right, what about the concept of purgatory? Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this idea also stemmed from the extra-biblical sources. Let's find out. Wiley tells us that the papacy believes in four levels of the afterlife. He tells us in the following. Papists have mapped out the other world into four grand divisions. The lowest is hell, the region of the damned. There are the ever-burning fires. There are Lutherans and all other Protestant heretics. And in fine, there are all who have died beyond the pale of the Roman Catholic Church. The next region in order is purgatory. Immediately above purgatory is Limbus Patrum where the souls of the saints who died before our Savior's time were confined till released by him and carried with him to heaven at his ascension. The last and remaining region is Limbus and Phantom. To this receptacle, the souls of children dying unbaptized are consigned, it being a settled point among the doctors of the Romish church that such as die unbaptized are excluded from heaven. And this comes from the Papacy, History, Dogmas, Genius, and Prospects, Book 2, page 374. Now, in the same source on pages 347 and 348, Wiley explains the concept of purgatory. He tells us, it is filled with the same fires and is the scene of the same torments as the region immediately beneath it, but with this important difference that those consigned to it remain here only for a while. It is the doctrine of the Church of Rome that no one enters heaven immediately on his departure. A short purgation amid the fires of purgatory is indispensable in the case of all, unless perhaps of those who are protected by a very special and most plenary indulgence. In other words, purgatory is one of the four places that the souls of men go after death. Can we find such doctrine in the canonical scriptures? Not at all. It is likely that the papal doctrine of four grand divisions is an elaboration from the Ethiopic Enoch, chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. In the Ethiopic Enoch, chapter 22, we read the following. And thence I went to another place, and he showed me in the west another great and high mountain of hard rock. And there was in it four hollow places, deep and wide and very smooth. How smooth are the hollow places and deep and dark to look at? Then Raphael answered one of the holy angels who was with me and said unto me, These hollow places have been created for this very purpose, that the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein, yea, that all the souls of the children of men should assemble here. And these places have been made to receive them until the day of their judgment, until their appointed period, till the great judgment comes upon them. Note this clearly. All these different doctrines, indulgences, praying for the dead, incantations, purgatory, all these doctrines play a major part in the papal worship. Because these doctrines cannot be found from Genesis to Revelation, the Catholic Church sought to canonize the books with these doctrines. Thus, the papacy has a justification to continue those things which are not in harmony with God. This is so retarded. I mean, so much of the worthless theology in the Christian world stems from these extra-biblical sources. It seems people would rather read junk than God's holy word. DS, I can guarantee you that if someone wrote some stupid work and named it the Epistle of Hot Dog, describing the sanctity of hot dogs, and then buried it in the ground, eventually someone from Rome would unearth it and declare it canonical scripture. Yeah, and what's sad is people would believe it was from divine origin origin so long as Rome said it came from the church fathers. So let us emphasize, as we look at the second step of the Counter-Reformation, that the Council of Trent made war on the Bible. Dowling says, The Latin Vulgate was put in the place of the inspired Hebrew and Greek scriptures as the only authentic word of God. 
from which all translations were therefore in future to be made, and to which all appeals were to be ultimately referred. And that comes from the History of Romanism, page 486. Not only was the Latin Vulgate elevated to unwarranted exaltation, the apocryphal writings were placed in this Bible as well. The Council of Trent declared, Whoever shall not receive as sacred and canonical all those books and every part of them as they are commonly read in the Catholic Church and are contained in the old Vulgate Latin edition, or shall knowingly and deliberately despise the aforesaid traditions, let him be accursed. And this is cited in the History of Romanism, page 485. Note this clearly. The Council of Trent taught that the only Bible that is acceptable is the Latin Vulgate with the intermingled apocryphal books. The papacy declared that if anyone does not accept the apocryphal books, they are accursed. Accursed by who? By the Catholic Church? Anyone who does not accept as scripture the intermingled books of bull is accursed by the Catholic Church. I suppose that they think that the Lord binds their decisions and obeys their orders as well. D.S., it's apparent that the leaders of the Council of Trent were not concerned with reforming themselves, but rather their main concern was creating a counter-reformation against Protestantism and the Bible that Protestants use. Exactly, Mike, and the objectives of Trent are summarized by Dr. Froome in the following. Luther's propositions were condemned by the council. Tradition and scripture were ostensibly placed on a par, though by implication, scripture is made subservient to, to tradition through insistence that it be understood only in the light of the tradition of the church, specifically the unanimous teaching of the fathers. The Latin Vulgate was declared the one authentic version, with the intermingled apocryphal books as canonical. The scriptures were declared not capable of being understood in and of themselves. Justification by faith, as it was proclaimed by Luther, was condemned, and no books of religion were to be printed without examination and approval by the church. This comes from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, page 475. According to the Council of Trent, no one is allowed to think for himself. And, of course, now they don't. In essence, uh, th this council declared that all men be automatons to Papal Rome's understanding of the scriptures through the lenses of the Apocrypha, the unwritten traditions of junk, and the Church Fathers. That's right, and we should ask, what is the danger of the Council of Trent for us as Christians today? Dowling says, in this council her doctrines became permanently fixed, and in its decrees all her anti-scriptural inventions were embodied. And that comes from the History of Romanism, page 540. Froome tells us, the Council of Trent, beginning in 1545 under Paul III and ending in 1563 under Pius IV, crystallized its actions into decrees that became the permanent law of the Catholic Church. And that comes from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, page 471. What is the danger of the Council of Trent for us today? Its actions and decrees became the permanent law of the Catholic Church, which means the permanent law of Catholicism is that the Bible is still considered a forbidden book, and people ultimately have no right to think outside of Rome's control. Now, I know that many people in America who are accustomed to the easy life have no conception that if Rome had absolute power over this country, things would change quickly. Too many today don't study history and they don't understand the dangers of Romanism. But if you, and I'll say this to the audience, if you stick around on these shows, eventually we are going to cover the present dangers of Romanism. We are going to spend a considerable amount of time dealing with the present dangers of Romanism. And that's coming on future studies. Now let's move back to the issue. Who are the champions of the Council of Trent? The very council that forms the basis of Catholic belief today? Who are the champions for taking liberty of conscience away from the world? Durant tells us the following. When at last the church dared to call that general council to which all Europe had so long looked for the quieting of its theological strife and the healing of its religious wounds, it was to a handful of Jesuits, to their learning, loyalty, discretion, 
resourcefulness, and eloquence that the popes entrusted the defense of their own challenged authority and the undiminished preservation of their ancient faith. The unequaled erudition of the Jesuits soon gave them paramount influence in the debates, and their unbending orthodoxy guided the council to declare war against Reformation ideas rather than seek conciliation or unity. And that comes from the Reformation, pages 916 and 928. The Jesuits were the strong arm of the Council of Trent. They were the champions for the abolishment of people's right to think for themselves. Very true. And now what are we stuck with? people who don't think for themselves. Yes, and the Jesuits were also the champions, as we are going to see, of much more. Now, the third part of the Counter-Reformation was the development of counter-prophetic interpretations. We are going to hold off on this step until further into this study. For now, we will discuss the fourth and fifth step of the Counter-Reformation, which was the index and the persecutions that followed. In 1559, Paul IV published the first papal index, in which 48 editions of the Bible were declared heretical, and 61 printers and publishers were banned from producing any more Bibles. Durant tells us, in Rome, Bologna, Naples, Milan, Florence, and Venice, thousands of books were burned. 10,000 in Venice in a single day. And that comes from the Reformation, page 924. Let us raise the question, who was the main weapon against the scriptures and the Protestants? The Jesuits were that weapon. We learn this truth from G.B. Nicolini, who tells us, through his, meaning Carafa, through his exertions and those of Loyola, an edict appeared on the 21st of July, 1542, appointing six cardinals, commissioners of the Holy See, and general inquisitors with power to delegate their authority to any person they pleased. All ranks of citizens, without exception, were subject to these inquisitors. Suspected persons were immediately imprisoned, the guilty punished with death, and their property confiscated. No book could be printed or sold without the authority of the Inquisitor. This terrible tribunal in the hands of the relentless and unforgiving Carafa spread desolation and dismay throughout Italy. As sacerdotal ferocity then called to its aid the might of the secular arm and thus became all-powerful, death assumed a new and more terrible aspect. And he who should invent instruments of torture to dislocate the limbs of the victims with the most exquisite and excruciating pains possible would be rewarded. Throughout Italy, as in various parts of Europe, you might have seen, whilst the infernal flames of the pile were ascending, the sinister and diabolical smile of the Jesuits who were aiming at the increase of their order, under the shade of this all-mastering power. And this comes from History of the Jesuits, Their Origin, Progress, Doctrines, and Designs, pages 60 through 62. So the Jesuits became the power behind the Inquisition, which resulted in the death of hundreds of thousands of people. That is correct. And notice the words of Durant. When Carafa himself became Paul IV, the institution was set in full motion, and under his superhuman rigor, the Inquisition acquired such a reputation that from no other judgment seat on earth were more horrible and fearful sentences to be expected. And that comes from the Reformation, page 925. Who was the strong arm of Paul IV? The Jesuits were the strong arm. And the work of the Jesuits did not end with Paul IV. It must be realized that the Inquisition reached great heights under the work of the Jesuits. The slaughter of St. Bartholomew was one of, if not, the worst slaughters in Protestant history. Between 50 to 70,000 Protestants were killed. Who was behind this diabolical work? R. W. Thompson tells us. After the admission of the Jesuits into Paris to bring about the terrible massacre of St. Bartholomew, an event so closely allied with others, of which they were the undoubted authors, that one must close his eyes not to see the evidence which points to their agency in that infamous transaction. 
And this comes from the Footprints of the Jesuits, page 113. It's without question that the Counter-Reformation was based on the destruction of Protestantism. Diaz, if the Inquisition was responsible for the deaths of thousands and thousands of Protestants, and if the Jesuits were the ones behind the Inquisition, then there's no doubt that the Jesuits are clearly the greatest enemy of Protestantism. That was exactly the view of Nicolini. It was he who said, I cannot too much impress upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek by every means, right or wrong, the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence, the duty they must fulfill, or cease to be Jesuits. They must be considered as the bitterest enemies of the Protestant faith. And this comes from History of the Jesuits, preface, pages 3 and 4. Okay, up to this point, you've emphasized that the Counter-Reformation had five steps, and they are, one, the formal recognition of the order of the Jesuits, two, the actions and decree of the Council of Trent, three, the Catholic counter-system of prophetic interpretations, four, the establishment of the index, five, the worldwide spread of persecution. And I believe that out of all five of these steps, the first and third steps have been the most destructive. The Jesuit order itself makes things a reality for Rome. If the Jesuits had never come into being, Rome would have withered away. And next to the existence of uh, Jesuitism, the Jesuit prophetic system have, have blinded the minds of Protestantism so that Romanism can conquer all opposition. Do you agree? Oh, I completely agree. The existence of the Jesuits and their counter-prophetic systems are the most insidious means of destroying the truth. The killing of Protestants in the Inquisitions only confirmed to the Protestants that Papal Rome is the Antichrist. The Jesuits realized that killing should be done through pawns, and they came to the conclusion that the best way to destroy an idea was with another idea. Of course, you're referring to the counter-system of prophetic interpretations. In the study of futurism, you elaborated how the Jesuits created futurism from the writings of certain church fathers. And, of course, how these church fathers borrowed ideas from extra-biblical writings. Yes, and in light of our present study today, do you now realize why the Council of Trent was so important to Papal Rome in order to create counter-prophetic systems? Yep, the Council of Trent justified extra-biblical writings and emphasized the truth be understood through the church fathers. The Belayar myth comes from the extra-biblical writings, and certain church fathers layered this myth on top of the true Bible. When the Jesuits created their counter-prophetic system, it was okay to endorse these myths because the Council of Trent declared the extra-biblical writings to be canonical. That is absolutely factual, and I emphasize to the audience that if they want to know the depths of the third step of the Counter-Reformation, they need to go to our study on futurism. In that study, we demonstrate that futurism is a Jesuit-constructed pseudopigraphal-based system that was invented to destroy the Protestant interpretation of prophecy. Futurism really does not have genuine biblical roots. Its roots are extra-biblical writings and mythology. Right. And in the study of futurism, the audience can find out the details about how futurism was created and from what mythology it came from. But there is one particular issue that I want to discuss today. How did the Counter-Reformation ever succeed in infusing the futurist system into Protestantism? The Counter-Reformation, with its futurist system of prophetic interpretation, has successfully caused the subversion of much of Protestantism in both Europe and America. And how did this happen? Through the Jesuits. Many evangelicals are now teaching Catholic doctrine. This is the reason Pope John XXIII and the Second Vatican Council between 1962 through 1965 focused on ecumenism and called the evangelicals separate brethren. It was legal for the papacy to come to this conclusion about much of the Protestant world because much of the Protestant churches gave up the prophetic views of the Protestant Reformation and they accepted the prophetic doctrines of the Counter-Reformation. I see. Well, is it true that the subversion of Protestantism really began to take form in Britain during the 19th century? Yes. History has recorded that in the 1830s, Samuel Rafi Maitland, James H. Todd, William Berg, and John Henry Newman and others of the Anglican Church were behind a great wave of Jesuit futurism that swept through England. 
Dr. Froome explains this situation in the following. He says, but now for the first time, Catholic futurism, initially projected by Ribera about 1585, began to obtain a foothold and then gain momentum among Protestants in Britain. Thus, the same concept that sought to break the force of the Reformation view of the Papal Antichrist by assuming a, f a future infidel Antichrist was again invoked to weaken the force of the great evangelical advent and prophetic awakening. Protestant expositors, some leaning toward Rome and some prompted by rationalistic concepts, joined hands in the attempt, perhaps unwittingly, to promote the Jesuit position. This, moreover, came to be tied inseparably with the Oxford Tractarian movement of the Anglican Church, wherein 90 tracts were scattered by the hundreds of thousands to favor Rome and to disprove the Protestant concept of Antichrist. And that comes from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 3, pages 655 and 656. Maitland and his companions are the progenitors of the great Oxford Futurist movement. Maitland made war on historicism by putting out a 72-page pamphlet supporting futurism. This pamphlet eventually transformed into 90 tracts that filled English Protestantism in the thousands. We should ask the question, who inspired the Oxford Tractarian movement? Dispensationalists will tell us that the leaders of this movement came to believe in dispensational futurism because they loved the Lord and decided to study their Bibles. Well, this is absolute garbage. I can guarantee that the Oxford movement was a Jesuit project in which the Counter-Reformation was being implemented into Protestantism for a long-term purpose. The Oxford movement definitely was a Jesuit project. I completely agree with Michael Day Semlin, where he emphasizes that Tractarianism is the continuance of the Counter-Reformation. He tells us in the following, The Reformed faith of Anglicans and free churchmen had been eroded over the centuries by the Counter-Reformation, and particularly in the 19th century after the 1833 launch of the Oxford movement in the Anglican Church by John Henry Newman and the other Tractarians. And this comes from All Roads Lead to Rome, the Ecumenical Movement, page 20. Seems to never be any end to this issue. The Hermetic Church Fathers are always used to authenticate Catholicism. Yes, but when we know the ideological sources behind these Church Fathers, it becomes very easy to expose this elaborate game. The Jesuits personally deceived the Anglican clergy by taking them back to the early Church Fathers. Without a clear understanding of the extra-biblical background in the writings of the Church Fathers, this is very deceptive. Oh, yeah. Yes, very deceptive. The Jesuits took the scheme of Ribera and Bellarmine of going back to the early fathers and personally deceived the Anglican clergy. The whole Anglican Tractarian movement not only adopted Jesuit theology from Trent, but they also had Jesuits to personally assist them in their conversion. The fact of the matter is clear. The whole Oxford movement with its birth of modern day dispensational futurism was, from its inception, a movement going back to Rome. Well, it appears that modern-day dispensational futurism, when it first came into being, was a movement going back to Rome. That is exactly the case. For example, John Henry Newman, like Maitland, was one of the main people in the Tractarian movement, and he held one of the highest positions in Anglicanism. Did he stay in Anglicanism? No, he did not. He converted to Catholicism. In fact, many Anglicans converted to Catholicism. A.J. Scott explains this situation. He says, Professors Puse, Newman, Palmer, Kebble, and Hook of the University of Oxford initiated the state of matters through their ogling with Catholicism, which afterwards got the name Puseism. But Vice Chancellor Newman led the way to the complete passing over to Rome, and in a short time, no fewer than 867 men of great consideration followed his example among whom were some very wealthy peers, with 243 who had hitherto been Protestant clergymen. And this comes from the Jesuits, a complete history of their open and secret proceedings from the foundation of the order to the present time, page 720. 
Why did Newman, along with many of the Anglican clergy, convert to Catholicism? They converted because the Jesuits undoubtedly deceived them into thinking that the Catholic Church and its prophetic position resembles the church closest to Christ. The movement of Puseyism or Tractarianism was, from its inception, the scheme of the Jesuits to transform Protestantism back into Catholicism through subtleties. Very factually, does Walter Walsh say, much of that in the early history of Tractarianism was kept a profound secret. And concerning the leaders of Tractarianism, Walter Walsh continues, and the lives of these men are now to be read their most confidential communications, one with the other, in which their love of popish doctrines and their desire for corporate reunion with Rome appear in the clearest possible light. And this comes from the Secret History of the Oxford Movement, page 184. It's clear that the purpose of the Tractarian movement was to gradually subvert Protestantism until Protestantism as a whole becomes very similar to the papacy. And what was the doctrine of this scheme? Jesuit futurism was the doctrine of Tractarianism, which was on its way to becoming dispensational futurism. Now, prior to the Oxford movement, a prophetic conference began about 1830 in Dublin, Ireland, known as Power Scourt Conference. Nelson Darby was the leader of this conference. He was purely dispensational at the beginning of the conference. He did not have a set prophetic methodology. But this was soon to change as he was influenced by Edward Irving, who had accepted the futurist system of the Jesuits. Interestingly, Irving already had a form of dispensationalism prior to his dealing with Darby. So Irving already had a form of dispensational futurism prior to, to his entrance into power scourt. During the duration of Power Scourt Conference, dispensational futurism was being developed into its more modern form. And let's not forget the work of Maitland, Todd, and Berg, who were developing 90 tracks supporting futurism. Is it true that Irving created a Pentecostal church? Yes, in 1832, during Power Scourt, he founded the church called the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, also known as the Church of the Irvingites. This could have been the very prototype of the dispensational Pentecostal churches of today. It is important to realize that at the Power Scourt Conference under Darby and the Plymouth Brethren, Irving's futurism was confirmed not only by the Jesuit-inspired tracts of Maitland, but a so-called manifestation of the Holy Spirit through a so-called gift of tongues took place. Between the years 1830 through 1832, a 15-year-old Scottish girl by the name of Margaret MacDonald allegedly spoke in tongues and received revelation that confirmed the futurist system. So, Diaz, you mean to tell me that somebody speaking in tongues authenticated the works of the Jesuits? As though someone speaking in tongues over dispensational futurism sanctifies it. Yeah. It is apparent that the whole situation with futurism from the days of the Belayar extra-biblical writings up to the Oxford movement is an ever-increasing ritual of stupidity. Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you ever heard? Not the most ridiculous. I'm sure you have more. Oh, but let me tell you about the cherry that goes on the dispensational futurist pie. MacDonald had a vision that Christ would come secretly and take his church out of the world. Samuel P. Treglis, who participated in the Power Scourt Conference, tells us the following. This is the doctrine of the secret coming of Christ, which many now preach as if it were the acknowledged truth of God. Not only is this doctrine of the coming of Christ not taught in the word of God, but if, in what has been previously said, there is any point of truth, then this whole system stands in distinct contradiction to what the scriptures reveal. When the theory of the secret coming of Christ was first brought forward about the year 1832, it was adopted with eagerness. It suited certain preconceived opinions and was accepted by some as that which harmonized contradictory thoughts. I am not aware that there was any definite teaching that there should be a secret rapture of the church at a secret coming until this was given forth as an utterance.
in Mr. Irving's church from what was then received as being the voice of the Spirit. But whether anyone ever asserted such a thing or not, it was from that supposed revelation that the modern doctrine and the modern phraseology respecting it arose. It came not from the Holy Scripture, but from that which falsely pretended to be the Spirit of God. And this comes from the Hope of Christ's Second Coming, pages 31 and 32. In 1832, the cherry was placed on top of the dispensational futurist pie. This is the year that the concept of the two-faced Second Coming of Christ was born. And this year, the following idea was put into effect. Christ's Second Coming will be divided into two parts. The first part will be a secret rapture of the church before the seven-year tribulation. The second part will be the glorious return of Christ with the church back to the earth after the seven years. Thus, the secret rapture concept was made to justify the futurist system. And people believe this nonsense. Oh, yes. Yes, a good chunk of the evangelical world believes all this. They believe in the secret rapture. They believe in the dispensational futurism. Ultimately, they've been subverted by the Jesuits. The Counter-Reformation has been very successful. Now, before we move on to other issues, can you explain in brevity how futurism has become successful in America? George M. Marston explains this issue. This new form of premillennial teaching imported from England first spread in America through prophecy conferences where the Bible was studied intently. Summer conferences, a newly popular form of vacation in the age of the trains, were particularly effective. Most importantly, Dwight L. Moody had sympathies with the broad outlines of dispensationalism and had his closest lieutenants, dispensationalist leaders such as Reuben A. Torrey, James M. G uh, James M. Gray, C.I. Schofield, William J. Erdman, A.C. Dixon, and A.J. Gordon. These men were activist evangelists who promoted a host of Bible conferences and other missionary and evangelistic efforts. They also gave the dispensationalist movement institutional preeminence by assuming leadership of the new Bible Institutes, such as the Moody Bible Institute, 1886, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, 1907, and the Philadelphia College of the Bible, 1914. The network of related institutes that soon sprang up became the nucleus for much of the important fundamentalist movement of the 20th century. And this comes from Understanding Fundamentalism and Evangelicalism, page 40. Now, out of the people that were just cited as important individuals for continuing the work of Tractarianism in America, Cyrus Ingerson Schofield becomes very important in our analysis. Between 1859 through 1874, Darby visited America several times. During this time frame, he managed to inspire Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. Schofield made dispensationalism popular. Cyrus Schofield was one of the most important figureheads in shaping the Southern Baptist Church and he changed the face of Protestantism in America. Schofield, after studying with Darby, took dispensational futurism and polished it up even more. He took out what appeared to be incongruities in the theology. He then bound this new theology into a Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. Much of Protestantism today has accepted this new theology as being the Word of God. And I can guarantee you that the Schofield Reference Bible allowed dispensational futurism to spread throughout America like wildfire. D.S. Too far many evangelicals today don't realize who was behind the work of Maitland, Todd, Berg, and the whole Tractarian movement. The reason that futurism made its way to Irving and Darby and later Schofield is because it flourished in the Anglican Church. And the reason futurism flourished in Anglicanism is for the simple reason that the Jesuits were personally behind this work. Today we have the so-called authentication of Jesuit futurism through the worldwide tongues movement. This was prototyped in the Irvingite Church with its Pentecostal authentication of the private revelation of MacDonald, the secret rapture. From one side down the other, the Jesuits are the architects of modern-day dispensational futurism and its new baptism of neo-Pentecostalism. Yes, the general of the Jesuit order is said to be the most powerful man on earth. Yes, and Queenborough reveals this power in the following. 
The general has usually stood towards the Pope much as a powerful grand feudatory of the Middle Ages did towards a weak titular Lord Paramount, or perhaps as the captain of a splendid host of free champions did towards a potentate with whom he chose to take temporary and precarious service. And the shrewd Roman populace have long shown their recognition of this fact by styling these two great personages severally the White Pope and the Black Pope. In truth, the society has has never from the very first obeyed the Pope whenever its will and his happen to run counter to each other. And that comes from Occult Theocracy, Volume 1, page 311. Cusack tells us, in Roman Catholic circles it is well known that the Black Pope is the term used for the general of the Jesuits. As the Pope is always robed in white and the general in black, the contrast is obvious. But those Romanists who do not greatly love the Jesuits, and their number is not limited, use the term as indicating that the Black Pope rules the White Pope. And that comes from the Black Pope, A History of the Jesuits, page 14. Note this clearly. The Jesuit Malachi Martin agrees that the Jesuit general has great power even in modern times. We read, by this early spring of 1981, for example, John Paul had already felt the effect, firsthand, of the enormous power that had accursed over centuries to the Father General of the Society of Jesus. So great is that power in Rome and in the world at large, and so widely is it recognized that whoever holds the office of Jesuit general also holds the uh, unofficial title of the Black Pope. And that comes from the Jesuits, page 80. Diaz, who carries out the serious espionage of the Jesuit order? I will answer that question through the following statements from Queenborough. We read, there are novices, scholastics, temporal coadjutors, professed of the three vowels and professed of the four vowels. And that comes from Occult Theocracy, page 308. Queenborough also emphasizes, the fourth vow is one of special allegiance to the Pope, promising to go in obedience to him for missionary purposes, whensoever and whithersoever he may order, a pledge seriously qualified in practice. And that comes from Occult Theocracy, page 309. Now, I would like to draw your attention to the extreme oath of the fourth vow. This gives us an idea of how serious the Jesuit order is in their purpose. And I'm going to read the extreme oath of the fourth vow in part. I, and the, there's a blank here for the name that goes in. I, blank, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul the Third, and continue to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the Matrix of God, and the Rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's Vice-Regent and is the true and holy head of the Catholic